My name is Jody Casper. I'm the Chief of Police here in Northampton. Uh, to my right is Corey Robinson. He is a sergeant with our police department. He's in charge of community outreach and community services. To his right is Adam Van Busker. He is one of our bike patrol officers. He works the evening shift and he's also one of our community outreach officers for downtown. Uh, to his right is Ryan Tellier, who is also uh, a bike patrol officer on the day shift and Ryan is also a community outreach officer. So we want to bring the people in our department who do our community outreach. I think it's good for all of us to you know, hear your thoughts on this and they're really uh, probably you know, some of the folks in the department who know most about kind of the downtown climate. They've been spending a lot of time in downtown so uh, they're curious to hear your feedback as well. So let's talk a little bit about cameras. Uh, so I wanted to just start with kind of where we are with cameras now, right? What does it look like? see if I can step away from this. Is this okay? It's easier for me. Yes. Thank you. Um, so I wanted to look a little bit at downtown. So some of you may or may not know uh, that it's certainly our highest call volume in the whole community, right? Obviously, any of you that are downtown, you know, that's where it's busiest. And so that's where we're busiest. Um, and there's lots of different kind of calls that we have in the downtown area. Certainly uh, theft, shopliftings, vandalism, harassment, uh, robberies, disturbances, open drug dealing, you can see we have lots of different kinds of calls that occur in the downtown area. Uh, we're looking at kind of, since we're the police, we always plan for horrible things that can happen. That's kind of what our jobs are, right? And we want to make sure that we plan for things and we can be best prepared, best trained, best equipped, best ready to deal with whatever may occur. It's events that have happened in cities across the world, as well as here in our very own country, uh, in different cities, uh, there's been a, a lot of things as well. So this makes us a bit nervous as we try to best plan to protect our community members and prevent um, you know, these sorts of things from happening. Uh, and we also just, Northampton is unique in the sense that we have a really high number of large events that occur downtown. I'm sure many of you have been at those. I know myself, my family has been at those events, uh, protests for various reasons, uh, marches, uh, first night, hot chocolate runs. Uh, it's fantastic. One of the reasons we love Northampton, no doubt, is that it's, it's awesome to be downtown. I was downtown the other night, I saw the fantastic chalk drawings, that's awesome. So we all love coming into downtown Northampton, and we do know that it, it's, we have big events there, sometimes with thousands of people. So this is what I've read, so I paid a little attention to social media this week, and I couldn't help but notice that in some comments, you know, a lot of people feel like nothing goes on here, which I understand that, and I'm frankly glad you feel that way. Um, and that's why I like to hang out here, too. It's actually a super safe community. I hope that you all feel that way. We feel like it's a super safe community. Just because it's super safe, uh, these are two different things. <laughs> Nothing ever happens here is different than it's super safe. Uh, it is a super safe community. You can look at our crime numbers, you know, that we report to the FBI, and you can look. It's safe. Things still happen, though. Um, so what happens? So this is, I wanted to keep things as fresh as they could be so we could look at really recent data. This is data from <coughs> downtown. So this is only things that are reported to us. Whenever we're looking at crime data, I always want to be mindful of the fact that there's a lot of people that don't report crimes to the police for whatever reasons. They may be afraid, they may be in a marginalized group that doesn't want to come forward. Whatever the reason may be, you know, this is the numbers that we have. This is just reported events. So you can see, um, this is not everything. This is the things that were probably most relevant to this conversation tonight. You may have noticed that this does not equal these numbers. Um, that is because this is the total number of calls in our downtown area in these years. The numbers above that are just one of the ones that stood out to me as some of the things that cameras could be helpful with uh, if we had them. And one of the ones I want to point out uh, notably is uh, shoplifting and theft. This is one of the um, common calls that we have in downtown. One of the things that's kind of, you know, pretty difficult, we're not talking about um, some bubble gum getting stolen or small items. We just, and I was saying this week, because I knew I was coming here to listen to you folks and, and talk with you about a few things. You know, what happened in the last week, we happened to have three or four shopliftings. Uh, one of them was $700 worth of items that were taken from a downtown business. Another one was 
300, and it was a repeat person who had just stolen the week before. And I don't know if you know this about our community, but people come to our community sometimes to steal. Um, they come in and they steal and they leave, and these are people who continue to engage in this behavior. And it's not small amounts of money. This is a lot of property that's being stolen out of our community. So those numbers are, are pretty high. Uh, we also have quite, quite a few uh, disturbances in the downtown area. So those are some that they stood out to me. Those, that's our actual data from downtown. And then, sure, we've got some cases that have been more notable. Uh, the TD Bank North robbery, I tried to keep these to the last year or two because, again, I really wanted to give you just where we are right now, what's going on with our data. And many of you may remember, during on Pride Day, uh, the uh, TD Bank North was robbed by a masked person. Uh, the person fled the bank. Uh, and luck luckily for us, you know, one of our officers happened to find the person just about 20 minutes later uh, and the person was arrested. Had that officer not found that person, it would have been very challenging for us to solve that because all we had was uh, images from inside the bank of a masked person. So that would have been very challenging. Uh, in Pulaski Park, a person who pulled a knife on a group of about six people um, the officer actually took that person at, at gunpoint. Uh, and that's not something that you might think happens in downtown. You know, your image of what happens downtown is not ours. So, and these are not, uh, this is not the only thing. These are just a few that actually I went around and said, what, you know, what stands out to you um, to, you know, what's happened downtown? And that's how we got these cases. Uh, on Main Street, we just, uh, last month, uh, a man who was assaulted with a dangerous weapon and had some, some head injuries from lacerations. Uh, bank of America robbery at knife point. Luckily, we had really good bank camera surveillance, and a Holyoke officer actually identified the suspect and we were able to make an arrest. Uh, you may have seen in the paper last week, we, along with the state police SWAT team, uh, it 3.30 in the morning or 4 o'clock in the morning, we were on Main Street. And, you know, this is the side of Northampton that you don't see. We see it. I was there. <laughs> and, you know, we have a SWAT team going into a building because we have a, someone in there that we know is in possession of an AR-15 assault rifle and a myriad of other weapons. So we served that search warrant, luckily, very safely. Uh, we did recover weapons, and we did recover an AR-15 a few nights later that was in this house that wasn't there when we went in. Um, and a bunch of, you know, drugs and paraphernalia. These are the ones we've been able to solve. Uh, but these are notable. These are serious crimes. We have victims. We have injuries. Some unsolved ones. Uh, Pleasant Street. This is a, we, a hate crime that we just uh, really want, want, to, want to be able to solve. And weren't able to solve it. Uh, Pearl Street and Main Street, a man was getting back into his car uh, and was... Uh, attacked by four men who jumped out of a car and he had to have facial reconstructive surgery, unsolved. Main Street, assault and battery, uh, DW stands for dangerous weapon. A female was grabbed from behind, a knife was held to her neck. Uh, a few days later, the same thing happened. She was robbed and a different woman turned over her, her wallet. Uh, unsolved. Dunkin' Donuts, armed robbery at knife point. A home invasion, where that means people went into a home you know, armed and, and um, uh, took things from inside. Yes, computers. This one's a little bit older, but there were two significant B and E stands for breaking and entering. That's a little bit of an older case, but uh, it was tens of thousands of dollars worth of lost property. What we later learned is that the suspects actually had driven up Main Street and by our station to see what time our ship change was. Uh, that certainly would have been a case where had we had cameras, we would have had the car and images of the suspects. Um, Cumberland Farms robbery. And again, I'll just have you know, you know the, the dates on some of these. These are recent events that we're talking about. Cumberland Farms, just January 2017. Armed robbery while masked. Main Street, many of you may know this one. Um, vandalism to the memorial statue where the owl was broken off. Um, so I, I think it's kind of rare where you have a community meeting and your police chief is convincing you of how scary your community is. I'm not trying to do that. That's not what I normally talk about. But I also think it's important that we're realistic about what goes on in our community. It's super safe. I walk downtown with my son and my family. I walk on the bike paths. I'm out all the time, not in this, just like you are. And, you know, I feel great and safe. It doesn't mean that things don't happen. It doesn't mean that we don't have 
real crime victims who have had weapons pulled on them and have been traumatized and all these things. And it, it's hard for us to, to not be able to solve those cases. So that's just an overview. A few crimes wanted to point out so we had a good idea of kind of what downtown is like. Our current city operated cameras. So we actually do have cameras already. And one of the things that I've actually heard quite a bit this week when we've talked about cameras, many people have come up to me and said, I thought we already had cameras downtown. Like, I didn't, right? That's what many people think. We don't. Um, there are many cameras downtown, but they're not the cities. So there's a lot of DOT or private businesses or whatever, but they're not ours. So we have uh, some in the parking garage, uh, 10 to 12 in there. We have them in the schools. All of our cruisers have cameras in them, so they're mounted right in the windshield of the police cars that are actually recording all the time. So if you, and we've actually pulled that sort of evidence before, so we may be looking for, we know that somebody was driving somewhere at one point, and we can pull that video from that cruiser and look back. Uh, actually, Sergeant Robinson specializes in this area of watching many, many hours and trying to uh, get clear pictures of plates and suspects and that sort of thing. So all of our cruisers already have the, that system in them. Of course, our police facility has cameras, many, many cameras inside on all of us when we go into the building and we're walking around to, you know, I go to my office and we walk around on the uh, main floors, in the lobby, uh, in the entryway, in the parking lot, and up, up and down Center Street. We, we look both ways on Center Street uh, with our cameras as well. And then the fire facility has some cameras also. So the, the city, this is not a new concept to our city. We already have some cameras. Uh, but they don't cover Main Street. Just some other cameras that uh, you may not know about either, because I was also really uh, interested to read some of the feedback this week uh, from members of the GLBTQ community who thought that maybe we would be recording and then there would be a threat to uh, members of our community. We actually already record most mass protests and large events. Uh, actually, I remember when I came on the job 20 years ago, and this was back in the day, but we used to have an officer who actually climbed up the fire escape of Calvin with one of those healthy camcorders and recorded things. I mean, that, that's, it's kind of our standard operating procedures that we do because if something does break out, it's hard in giant crowds to, you know, always have a good record of exactly what happened. And also, if there's something that begins to break out that is dangerous and we need to know where people are, then that person can direct people to where the problem is. So we've been recording um, large events for a long time. We already do that. Um, the other thing we do is we use a piecemeal network of cameras. So there already are a lot of stores in Northampton that have camera systems in them. Some are horrible, we've worked with those, and some are great and they're really good clear color pictures. And when stores have shoplifting or they have some other assault or robbery or whatever, um, they can you know, give us those, uh, certainly if it's in their own store. Another thing that we do is if we have an event happen, we then go around to all the stores and say, hi, you, know, you mind if we have this? And um, it, it's what always happens inevitably is the manager is the only one that can get access to the tape and they're in Rhode Island and they'll be back in a few days and then they get up and they um, burn us a copy of something, the date and time stamp is wrong, the quality of the footage is wrong, it doesn't work with our software. So while we do have this piecemeal network, it's certainly not a, a perfect uh, system. Some of them have been very helpful and we've been able to get things and a lot have been not so helpful, but we've still uh, checked them to see if we're able to identify any suspects. Oh yeah, I enjoyed this one this week in Harold's. This gentleman dropped his money and they want to return it. So that's Harold's. And uh, it's a nice quality camera. That's really good color. And you know, you may not have known that when you're in Harold's ordering your ice cream, you're on camera. You're on camera in many places you go downtown. Um, this was an armed robbery we had, surveillance <coughs> in a convenience store. Really clear picture of the suspect who had just done an armed robbery. So really clear footage. This is not the norm. This is usually what we get. Uh, this is an armed robbery. This is the victim, an elderly male who was working the register at a convenience store. And this is the suspect wrestling with, with him with a knife. Uh, so you can see the challenges. These are all, you know, this is four separate cameras. This is really hard to work with. So this is usually more consistent with the quality that we get when we're looking for, you know, good, uh, you know, being able to identify people who 
did things. Um, other communities, what do we have around us? So East Hampton, uh, they have cameras around there downtown. Uh, if you've gone to Mount Tom's Ice Cream, uh, you've walked by, there are city cameras there. Amherst has cameras downtown, Belchertown, Holyoke. So we're, you know, in that sense, when you compare us with others, you know, some similar size communities, uh, they have them and, and we don't. So what would it look like? Uh, certainly uh, no audio, because that would be illegal. So they would be video cameras only with no audio. Uh, no license plate readers or facial recognition. I know that that is a concern that I saw in social media this week. Uh, as far as you know, creating lists of people's names and like, cars and things, um, we don't. This is not that. This is a. This is just a camera that does nothing other than just record images. Um, fixed camera. So, by fixed camera, the cameras would be set in such a way so that you would see a view. So, say it was Pulaski Park, it would frame in Pulaski Park. And if I or any of our staff wanted to take that camera and like turn it up or go down the sidewalk or go somewhere else, it doesn't do that. The, the, the cameras are fixed. You can zoom within the frame. So just like you know, you, you're looking at a set picture of the park, maybe there's something that you want to look at. You can zoom in within that frame, but you can't move outside of the restrictions that are on the fixed cameras. Um, yeah, all, and all cameras would be posted, certainly just in areas along Main Street. We're not talking about any other areas of the city. The access would be at the police department in the station officer area. So we have an officer, if you've ever been into our lobby, who uh, sits behind the glass. It's the person you talk to when you pick up the phone. They already have a lot of screens in there. And actually, that officer has the screens for the ones I talked about before, all inside the station. They're in charge of watching the people who are in our cell blocks and booking to make sure they're uh, being safe and not doing anything. Occasionally, uh, people who are in our holding cells are, are doing things that are dangerous, so we have an officer to watch them. Uh, and also the ones that I talked about on the outside of the building and such. And they're also writing reports and taking phone calls and talking to people in the lobby. So it would be in that, that area. Um, we don't have anyone to sit and watch these cameras. This is not, we're not, we don't have that. We have just enough staff to do the jobs that we're doing, and certainly nobody that we could dedicate to sitting and watching cameras all, all day. We, we don't have that. This would be in there. Um, if, say, there was an, an incident where there's a domestic incident and someone was fleeing the scene, the officer could turn and look at that and make that screen bigger if it was going to be somewhere where the person was, maybe get a direction of travel or what they were wearing for clothing, but um, they wouldn't be just watching these cameras all the time. Um, and there's also window blanking technology, and what that means is our intent with putting any cameras out there would be that they wouldn't capture any private space. It's certainly this, everything we want to look at would be in public space. Um, and so the example I gave before with Pulaski Park, you know, that's all public space in there. But if we did have a camera that was, say, looking down Main Street, there's kind of a classic picture of Main Street. It's on the front of Tracy Kidder's book, Hometown. It's from City Hall, I think, and it's kind of going down the street. There are private residences up there. And so the camera technology comes with something called window blanking or privacy zones, where essentially that can be blurred out. So even if the officer wanted to go on and try to zoom into something there, it wouldn't, you couldn't see anything, it would be blurred out. So we could blur out uh, any private spaces, and we would blur out any <coughs> private spaces that would, had been inadvertently captured in the placement of the camera. Our primary use certainly is criminal investigations. Uh, this is not uh, anything that we would use for traffic enforcement. I read that in some of the comments that we're going to be um, going after jaywalkers and people doing whatever, we're not doing that. We don't have the time to do that. We don't have the interest in doing that. And that's not the, the use that we foresee these as being, that would not be a valuable use of this. Um, so really just for criminal investigations like the ones I mentioned before. Um, certainly we would develop a, a policy. Uh, we have a proposed draft. I'll talk a little bit about that, hence the asterisk. Uh, we would be required to, all of us in the building would have to review that policy. We would have to all have to be trained on that. Uh, everyone would have to have individual login credentials. And viewing would be possible at the desk, but like I said, there's no dedicated staff to watch this. Uh, footage would be retained for 21 days. Why 21 days? Because that's the size of the system that 
we could really kind of would make financial <coughs> sense to do. Um, and then if there was something, like any of those aforementioned events that I talked about, if we needed to burn a copy and say, yeah, we actually want to re you know, retain this information for longer than the 21 days, we would burn a copy just like we do for our provision, which are the ones in the cruisers, and we save that and log it in as evidence. So that's the same you know, system that we have uh, now. So the draft policy, uh, this is a recommended model policy from CALEA. CALEA is our national accrediting <coughs> program for police departments. So we're not CALEA accredited, but they have really great model policies, and we wanted a really great model policy to, to base ours on if we move forward with this. It covers all these different topics that I think are topics that probably many of you are probably pretty passionate about, you know? Um, so, and on the bottom, just to note, you know, Managing policy violations would be included in that policy. And so right now, you know, we have access to, in the RMV, uh, we, we can run, run you, we can run ourselves if we have a legal reason to do that. And we can see your, your picture and your, your name and where you live and what you've been arrested for and all these things about you. It's very personal and private information. Uh, but it's extremely protected by the law and our officers well, it would be a violation of a variety of things to in any way misuse that. So say I want to look up uh, Tom Brady and, and learn about where he lives and go say hi to him. That would be, that has happened not in our police department, but that has happened. Uh, that would be a violation of the law and of our policy and there, there are severe disciplinary actions that take place for that. So that's, uh, it's, it would be similar to that where you have an individual login credential. Uh, we know who, who would be looking at the system and we could see if there were um, violations of our policy. And this is also a question I saw a, a lot in social media is kind of like, why now? And I will ag agree with that question in the sense that, yeah, I actually think we should have had them for a while. I don't think that may, that may not be the popular opinion in the room, but when I look at those lists of cases and I think about how we could have prevented some of those, some of those were, you know, there was one particularly, the woman that had the knife held to her throat, two women, that happened a week apart. Had we been able to solve the first one, we would have had potentially one less victim because it was likely the same person. Um, so it's something that our community, for as busy as we are downtown and as centralized as we are, uh, we, we, they would have been a really useful law enforcement tool for us uh, for a, a, a while. Uh, and also, you know, the technology is out there. Certainly when I talked about going around to all the businesses and piecemealing together different camera views and different from inside stores. Um, that's, it takes a ton of time and we invest that time, but it, this would be much faster and much more efficient. Uh, I can say uh, on the uh, vandalism to the, the owl statue, for instance, that's a great example of a case where we just got that, uh, like recently, today or yesterday or very recently. It's been, I don't know, when did that happen, the owl? A couple months ago, right? So that's just a good example of how long it takes us to actually get, when we're relying on outside sources, to get video in hand. Um, and then the other thing is, like, I, it's funny, I had someone come up to me at, I think it was, uh, I think maybe the Women's March or something, and they said, oh, it's such a beautiful day, like, you guys must, it must be fun to work this and all that, and I'm like, <laughs> When we have large events, we want everyone to have a great time. Our individual stress level of horrible things that can happen, because that's how we operate, is through the roof. And like, I don't know if you've noticed first night over the last few years, but we park fire trucks and dump trucks across the street now to block cars from driving through us, right? It's a different world. And, and I don't want to be the one to know that this technology is out there and, and know that it's something that, um, you know, could have been useful for us to, to help solve this and, and, and solve some of these other crimes and not bring it to the attention of the community and not have this discussion. You know, like, this is out there. You've seen, I'm sure, if you, you looked at video from the Boston Marathon or any of those, it's often video that gives you those images of people who are doing these things. So, you know, we have a great community and a really engaged community, as I said. You know, you're out there marching maybe, you're, you're protesting, so is my family. You know, I'm not like this, uh, you know, um, I'm protective as we all are of all of us, our whole community together, us included, of what happens when we put 3,000 people standing together on Main Street and what kind of opportunity that is for someone who disagrees with our community's beliefs and our right to protest. So that's why now. 
the world is different. And, and for me, um, looking back, I think there's crimes we could have solved. There's things that could happen. I hope they never happen here. But as I said before, our job is to plan for things to happen, hope that they don't. But if they do, be best prepared to manage them. So the benefits, uh, certainly the biggest one is swift identification apprehension of suspects. I mean, that is the goal, is to catch people so that they don't go off and do something else to someone else. Uh, deterrence or reduction of criminal behavior. You know, the one that I think is strongest around this is really theft in our downtown area. I think I'm, I'm curious about the impact it could have on other sorts of uh, behavior, but I don't know that it would. I'm sure many of you have read some of the research out there, and, and you know, I've read both. It goes both ways. But theft is something that, as I said, we have people that come into our community specifically just to go through our downtown businesses and steal from them hundreds of dollars, you know, thousands of dollars over time. Um, and it's those sorts of events that I'm optimistic that this system would be very helpful for. Um, live monitoring for command center, we already do that, so that's no nothing new, but right now we rely on MEMA. So we call in a state uh, agency and we use their kind of command center. So it has a trailer and it has cameras on it. And when we do that, the, the, one of the many reasons we do that, but one of the great things about it is we have changed the way that we uh, cover and, and how we work at, at big protests. We don't want to have large numbers of uniformed police officers standing while people are protesting. We want people to be able to protest, uh, and we focus on traffic and pedestrian safety and just looking for any uh, one who may be into our community, may look like a threat to the crowd. But in general, we're standing pretty far away, and you may not see as many of us as you may have seen in the past. And that's because we have a camera, so we're able to sit back and, and watch and see if the crowd's getting bigger, so we think we're going to need to do something else with traffic or we're going to have to have you know, more people come in if we think something's going on that's going to require more of us. So uh, that's something we already do, something that's very useful and certainly something that's recommended by you know, all, all agencies right now that have large events. Uh, well, ideally we'll solve more cases. Um, mm -hmm. I haven't talked too much about it, but traffic collision investigation, you know, we've had some bad accidents downtown, we, we've had a fatality within the last few years. Um, but even aside from the really large ones, we have a lot of accidents downtown. So be a good record for traffic collision investigation. And one of the things that we're all seeking, and I think is harder and harder to find today, is truth. You know, it, it provides a record of an event. It's, it's exactly what happened. And I read somebody's uh, comment on social media that she was recently on a, a grand jury. And she said, you know, like, it's, you're sitting there and you see evidence and it's clear. I mean, no, it's hard to argue with what you're looking at on a still a camera with no audio. You, you see what you see, you can make your own interpretation of it. Um, so for us, you know, we're working out there too. We like recordings of, um, you know, everything that's going on so that we can provide this truth uh, of what happened. So those are the benefits that we see them. And uh, that's my overview. I'm sure we don't have anything else to say, so I guess that's it. So, uh, yes. So, and if you do, there's a microphone up here, so if, it's, if you want, you can, I can move this out and you can come up, or you can just shout out and I'll re-speak uh, whatever you ask. So do you have a question? Um, three quick points. Sure. Number one, I'm all in favor of many types of surveillance. Um, Number two, I think uh, when we had that last rally regarding uh, Charlottesville, uh, the, all of the first responders did a wonderful job and the folks did a wonderful job too. Um, I actually carried my iPad through the whole night so I was surveilling. Uh, my last point is, um, will, we, will anybody who's a citizen have uh, access to any of the uh, viewings? Yeah, that's a good question. So the question is whether or not citizens could look at what we have, right? So I have actually a call out to the state, public records, because public records are out there and people can get public records. Um, 
submit them, and we, you know we're very good at complying with public records inquiries. Uh, there are some components that might be protected. So if it's a investigative, meaning maybe we were monitoring a, a drug transaction or something, so some would be protected. Medical information is protected. You know, so. Um, I can't say for certain that every single bit of it would be available. Some definitely would be available. And uh, I think uh, there's also a, a grave concern in the uh, immigrant mm -hmm. community that uh, some of this information could be pumped into places they don't want it to go. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, I'm working with immigrants to, in the courts to see mm -hmm. yeah. that issue. Right. So this question is about immigrants. And if people are here, there's concern that, well, what about, what if ICE comes into your building and says, I want all your footage? Um, so I, I get that. And you know we're a sanctuary city. You know where the police department and your city I leaders guess. stands on I that. Um, <laughs> but. So, and it's a great question, and it's not one that I necessarily have a great answer for right now. You know, this is a, we're exploring this as a topic. Yes. Um, Thank you. Thank you. you know, uh, w it would be something that we would need to look into, quite honestly. Um, this is public space, so if ICE wanted to sit out on Main Street and watch someone, they could do that. Uh, clearly, getting our tapes would, would, you know, perhaps speed up that process. Uh, but I don't have a great answer to that. It would be something we'd really have to look into. And I'm fully here to acknowledge that like, we're just exploring this. I'm exploring it with you and we're talking about these issues so that I can know what those issues are and, and think about you know, how, how we might respond to that sort of inquiry. Yep, thank yep, you. go ahead. You're welcome, Two thank you. Can yep. you talk about funding yep. and continued funding? Yes. Um, and then also, can you talk about oversight Mm -hmm. and continued oversight because I know if you <coughs> install cameras you say now that there may not be additional programs but like a camera is physical and play checking is technology that mm -hmm. we may not know that goes their way. Do you have a system in place that like every step of this process is looked over by the oh, I mean we don't have that in place now because well, again <laughs> here we are you know and yeah, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's an interesting consideration, one that I read a lot about, too, in social media as far as, like, yeah, oversight. I mean, is there outside oversight of, yeah, outside oversight of how this could ever look? How, how, could, how can we make sure that there's, this is operating the way that it should operate? Um, and, I mean, it's tricky, right? It, just like we have access to all these other things. I mean, we have access to what I mentioned before, RMV information and... All, all your personal information we have access to. And we don't, the outside agents we have are agencies that come in and they do a random you know, audit of us. So is there a way to do that? Could it be built into the policy? Potentially, it's just a matter of kind of how that would look. And funding. And, uh, and funding. It's, uh, so the quote that we have right now from a company that we've reached out to is around 70, 80,000. Like, I'm hesitant to give that without really, I mean, I'm you know, giving it to you now, but like, I can't, I'm not locked into that, you know. Um, that's kind of where it's at, right? It's somewhere around there. We don't have that in our budget. It would be potentially a capital improvement uh, program request, but that's also up in the air. Oh, no, a city, city. Yep. Uh, did I answer all your questions? Okay, I'll get you, and then I see some more over here. But right, right here. Yes, with the no. Um, I have a no. <laughs> yeah, got this it. This is yeah. how I feel. Okay. Um, I actually don't have a question. I came because uh, I saw on the social media post that you had put out from the Northampton PD that this was sort of a listening session, and you wanted to hear how the community felt. Mm -hmm. So I'm I'm here not to ask questions, but just to tell you how I feel. Mm -hmm. I think this is a terrible idea. And then this is the oh. worst possible time for me. Thank you. Thank you. Here's why. There's been no uptick in crime. And this narrative of be afraid, quit, be afraid, but now trust me. I'll save you, and I'm going to do it by watching you really closely. He's not Northampton's values. Mm -hmm. It wasn't Northampton's values before Charlottesville, and it wasn't Northampton's values before 9-11, and it's still not Northampton's values. And I see no reason to change our values now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The other problem is that right now, 
we're dealing with a federal government that has so increased its surveillance apparatus and its attempt to target communities like Washington, it's setting up cameras by the police that they can access whenever they want just by sending a warrant is a terrible idea for keeping us safe from what is now the primary threat. The primary threat, as I see it, is not the ukulele wielding assault. <laughs> it is the federal government watching us and trying to find out who the protesters are, who the troublemakers are. <laughs> I would rather lose all the owls than lose the freedom that we have right now. And just like you have trouble piecing together all the video, ICE would have trouble piecing together all the video. The FBI would have trouble piecing together all the video. And that, for Northampton, for people that care about protest and free speech and who are really, really intent on resisting the current federal administration, that's a good thing. Mm -hmm. And I would ask you not to change it. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Sure. Uh, yeah. So a few people, a few women in the past year have said they've been assaulted on Main Street, mm -hmm. and when they reported to the police, the police said they they were powerless because they didn't witness it themselves. Mm -hmm. um, so, so these women assaults were, they said they felt well. I guess it's like it's legal to assault me unless they do it in front of a police officer. So would be being videotaped actually, you know, do something about protecting these women? Particularly women who don't have much of a voice, homeless women who are, who are being assaulted. Would these cameras actually help the police protect these women? Mm -hmm. Okay. So, will, right, would the cameras help protect women on Main Street? So, to be clear, when you use the word assault, do you mean, in, are you talking about sexual assaults or are you talking about a physical assault? Physical Just, assault. Okay. So, because the sexual assault, that is not how that would happen. That would be a whole different narrative. But when we use the word assault, to be clear to everyone, we're talking about a, a physical assault. So, maybe someone was punched or kicked or something. Um, if it's a, not a domestic situation and we don't witness that, we take the reports and we just can't make an arrest. We, we could still file charges. So people, victims in those crimes may feel like, may be frustrated that maybe we weren't able to make an arrest, but that's, that's we can't. Uh, it, we didn't witness it. It's a misdemeanor offense, so that is our kind of, uh, that's how we handle those. Um, would cameras help? I don't know. What do you think? I mean... Would it, if you're a juror on a case with an, with an assault and battery and you see a video versus a, you know, this person said, this person said, I don't know. That's why we're here. I mean, would that be helpful? And do we want that? And some people don't want that, but I don't know. So does that answer your question? Yes. Okay. Jesse? Two questions. The first one is, yeah, here are. Would, yep. the, would, would the recordings be subject to FOIA and specifically if someone wanted something that <coughs> the police weren't interested in as far as a criminal investigation, but for a, 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 another matter, or is right. it solely uh, accusatory? Okay, so the question is about the Freedom of Information Act and whether or not we would release you know, videos to someone who, say, came into the lobby. I, and as I think I mentioned, that that's a call that I have out to the state. That's a curiosity that I have. Um, some cities, and some stuff is definitely covered. As you know, like, you know, public records law protects some privacy issues, um, medical stuff, uh, domestic violence. There's a lot of things that are, so if you walked in and asked me for, can I have this copy of a domestic violence record, we would not give that to you, right? Mm -hmm. So there's some things that are well protected. But just general kind of everyday operations on the street, would that be subject to it? I'm going to guess with the recent changes in public records law that, yeah, it, it would be. And, and that's, that's the, the change in public records law. Here's my other question. Yeah. Is Resources are limited. Why not request, I haven't heard you mention body cameras. Yep. Why not request the same amount that you're requesting for body cameras? And, and if, you can't, if, if this amount that you're requesting can't cover body cameras, yep. you can create a fund. There's, there are ways of doing it. You might say it doesn't have to be either or. Well, why not body cameras? And other sure. municipalities in the state do it. So I, I know the answer is not it can't be done for anyone. Oh, it can be done. Yeah, yeah. So body cameras, I didn't put it in here because I, I knew what... I knew people would ask, so why put it in, right? Uh, so body cameras, this, these cameras are about dealing, the goals, right, as I've said, are 
large scale protests, protection, solvability of crimes, that sort of thing. Body cameras have different goals. Body cameras are documenting your police's action. And that is extremely important as well. Um, most departments that have put in body cameras that have seen successes with it have seen successes on a reduction in complaints against the police and a reduction in excessive use of force, right? So last year, our officers handled over 40,000 calls for service. We had two citizen complaints. So just looking at the activity that goes on downtown versus those two complaints that were frankly about like rudeness, um, it's hard for me to say our officers are doing stuff that's wrong that requires us to have them wear body cameras to work on reducing. You know, those are the departments that have had success with it. That's why they're putting them in place. So when you read about those great successes, that's often what they're targeting. And many of you have probably seen body camera footage and what's it look like? It's a mess, right? It's you see hands, it's all over the place. I don't even know that that provides a clearer picture. That being said, it's a conversation that we're always having in the building. We talk about body cameras frequently. And it's, you know, how, how could that look? How would that look? It's something we're certainly open to, and we've been open to it for a long time. We just had a staff meeting, and it's something that our own staff brought up because our staff doesn't want to be accused of doing things that they didn't do wrong either, you know? So, you, you know, that is a reality for us as well. We're going out and doing our jobs, and we've had that discussion. But that's where we are with it. We're at a discussion. You know, we, we talk about it. Uh, we've got Boston piloting it right now. I'm curious to see kind of how it works for Boston, how it is for their their staff, how it is for their um, you know use of force, all that kind of stuff. So we're watching Boston closely. But if the purpose yep. is crime reduction, studies have shown that they reduce crime too. That was one of their main goals. Yep. And so my question is unanswered. If you're considering both, why are you specifically asking one for one hundred thousand dollars for this policy to spy on the entire public? And you can disagree with that conversation. No, it's okay. Just fine with you. Yep. And if body cameras have the same exact goal. That's not the goals, and that's what concerns me. Right. They're, they're slightly different goals, and if you saw in the beginning, like, body cameras aren't going to do, do us much good when we're trying to solve some of the things up there that are unsolved. It's not going to have any impact on that. Uh, so the goals of the, you know, exterior cameras, that's what we're talking about more. We think it'll have uh, an impact on being able to stop, you know, the theft and all those other things that I talked about. Body cameras are a different thing, and we're... You know, we're open, and, and that's the best that we can be, is be, be open to them. And as I said, we keep a close eye on them. So. Can I take you back on this question? Yep. Quick? Yeah, there's other people I really need to get to. Yeah, you've been, she's been raising her hand for like so long. long. Yeah. Go ahead. If we have cameras on one street, Main yep. Street, there are one spot in town, isn't that going to displace the crime to other areas? Would it be more sensitive to have cameras randomly throughout town, watch people randomly rather than on one set? Right, right. So, and I absolutely get that. And if you, I don't, if you read up on a lot of kind of the studies, it talks about displacement. It studies displacement. And when it, when you read about displacement, it's really a lot about like drug, drug dealing. That's one of the things that, if you use that as a goal to get rid of, that's something that would just get kind of pushed to the side. But when you have stores and that are being, you know, stolen from, and you have a lot of people in, in one place, that, that's the crimes that may occur there are not being displaced. So yes, there certainly would be displacement of some things that we've talked about, but a lot of the others, they're, they're where our downtown is. So let me get you, I'm yeah, so sorry, I'm you. sorry. I appreciate yeah. it. Yep. So um, I want to respond to a point that was brought up earlier about um, assault against women in particular, and I want to share with you that I am a survivor of sexual assault. And I'm speaking for myself, and I think I'm also speaking on the behalf particularly, particularly of women who are criminalized, like homeless women, poor women, and women of color, that there is absolutely nothing that would make me feel less safe in my community as a, a survivor than having increased police capacity. Mm -hmm. Nothing. <laughs> And then on, on that point, um, I wanted to mention that we, we know that when the budget, uh, which, you know, we're, you know, you're asking for an increase in police budget from the city, um, 
when you increase the capacity and the technology and the budget of a police department, the people who suffer the most are the people who are criminalized in that community. And those are poor people, <coughs> homeless people, and people of color. The same type of people who get assaulted by their Hampton police officers. Last month, last month, um, why on earth would you not spend that massive sum of money on something that actually makes our communities safe? And what makes our communities safe is getting people out of poverty, getting people access to medical care. It hasn't, the police, increasing the police budget is not gonna make women safer. Um, I don't really care about private property or protecting private property. I care about the people. Oh. on something that actually makes a difference in people's lives for the better. Thank you. Uh, I have more of a statement too. Um, I, as a citizen of Northampton who's homeless, I have a unique perspective and awareness of the happenings in downtown. I can inform you, for example, that you can't really get heroin in Northampton. You have to go to Holyoke. <laughs> so are these cameras going to be set up on the routes to Holyoke? Route 5 and 91 and whatnot, it's usually the bus, because it's usually poor people who do heroin, we're depressed and whatnot, we're poor, you know. Anyways, um, most police calls in downtown district are for petty crimes. Petty crimes are usually best solved by the citizens, by community policing, by the police working better with the citizens. For example, people like me, if the police had a better relationship with me, they'd know a lot more about what's going on downtown. <laughs> a lot more. Um, I think the, citizen, the citizens' money would be way better spent on body cameras. And definitely, in the, think the past is the past, but in the future, the citizens will save a lot more money from body cameras. Um, better community policing and officer-citizen relationships will better enforce the small amount of crime that downtown Northampton does experience. That's all. Thank you. Um, it was touched on a little bit earlier, um, but uh, you pointed out that we are in fact a sanctuary city, mm -hmm. um, and uh, a large portion of your um, thing uh, was uh, frankly some fear mongering around terrorism. Mm -hmm. um, and I wanted to uh, let you know that there's been a study, um, <coughs> there's information from the National Safety Council. Um, you can Google it. How likely is a terrorist attack? Um, and find a number of studies um, which are done within the past six months, and your about 11 times more likely to be killed from bicycling than a foreign-born terrorist, and I don't see our fine town uh, getting rid of that anytime soon. Um, and as for uh, terrorists that you know are, are homegrown, that was a legal free speech gathering in Charlottesville. Um, you know, you're also about nine times, an American is about nine times more likely to be killed uh, by the police than a terrorist. Um, one of the things you talked about were <laughs> one of the things you talked about were large events, um, and uh, as well as um, some uh, assaults against women. Um, and I take issue against uh, you using uh, you know the large events like Pride and like uh, Hot Chocolate Run, which I believe is for um, domestic abuse survivors, um, when uh, you know people who uh, have a police officer as relative are two to five, four times more likely to experience violence, uh, to experience domestic abuse at the hands of that police officer. Um, so I don't think, that you might think that that is going to, you know, keep queer people in our community safer to have this thing and keep, uh, you know, women safer, but the reality is that that's not true and that's, that's not just my political opinion, that is statistics. Um, and I am not a survivor myself, but uh, as a female body person in this town, this scares me so much more than those stories that you, you told about uh, assault happening. Um, and I have relatively little, little to fear from the police in this, in this town or in, in any place in this country. Um, and this makes me, you might think that this is a pro-community sort of thing, you know, making our community safer, but this makes me want to not leave my house. And I'm in a relative position of privilege. And I don't want to leave my house. I don't want to. I wouldn't want to. I wouldn't want to leave my house as much. I wouldn't want to interact with our community as much. And I wouldn't want to spend my money at businesses in this town as much um, if this were something that happened. When every time I went outside, that my home is the only place that I could be free from being seen all the time. 
Um, and most of the things that you mentioned, one you uh, showed literally that our crime statistics have gone down from 2016 to 2017. Um, so that's not really a concern. Um, most of the things that you talked about were uh, things that were happening in businesses or traffic. And we have traffic cameras, and I, I recognize the issues that you um, you know mentioned with the shop cameras, but maybe you know if there's a, you know if this continues to if that is continues to be a problem. You know, stores will get better cameras. I see no reason as a citizen to subsidize businesses having better security. I think that's uh, <laughs> um, most of what I, I, I wanted to say. Uh, like you said from the Facebook comments, um, most people already feel like this is a safe place. And the people who don't feel that it's safe, the people who are in oppressed positions in our community, are the ones who are going to feel less safe by this, by this technology, not more safe. And the rest of us already feel relatively safe where we live. Um, and so, like I said, it was the, it's mostly the shops and it's mostly traffic. This doesn't seem to be filling a deep need. It seems like it might be a slight Im Im improvement um, in your eyes. Um, but Mostly it seems like a new toy, um, it seems like making things easier for y'all, and the thing is that like, being a police officer isn't shoot em up, it shouldn't be, um, it shouldn't be super spy, it should be going through the nitty gritty, it should be having to, to go through you know, the, the grainy footage. Um, and I think that's kind of a uh, you know, check and balance in, it, in, it, in itself um, that I'd like to you know, uh, keep um, and uh, you know, I'd like just like to echo that um, there's a lot of better things that our money can go to. Some of these crimes are crimes of survival, um, and I'd much rather my money go towards towards that than uh, watching my neighbors. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> well, I would like to be able to go out in public freely with nobody watching me. Uh, the last time I read the Constitution, it talks about life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. It talks about I have the right to be secure in my person. These cameras are a violation of both of those. They are both called unalienable rights, which means you cannot change them at your whim. Most of what you talked about has nothing to do with deterrence. It's after the fact. It's proven studies. Police presence. Walk a beat. Get out of your car, get away from all your cameras, away from all your technology, meet the people on the street, and be a part of what's going on. Okay? I, I'm, I'm incredibly appalled that this so-called progressive, diverse community now wants to institute 1984. You know? <laughs> says, if you're willing to trade, your essential liberty for some safety you desire deserve neither safety nor liberty. Yeah. I am not willing to trade my essential liberty to make your job easier and to make the encroachment of Big Brother, 1984, the federal government coming to get us any easier. Okay? And my mother taught me as a small child to take someone's picture I didn't know without their permission, is rude. <laughs> I'm 33 years old. I was born here. I'm transgender. I was sexually assaulted on the Smith College campus. I'm a domestic violence survivor. And I don't feel safe around the police. I feel oh. less safe. And I would never have reported my assault to the police based on my trans identity. I can only speak for myself, but this is a violation of our rights, it's a violation of our privacy, it makes me extremely uncomfortable, and I'm looking to buy a house, and I can afford a house, and I'm grateful for that, and I'm looking outside of my family, and I grew up here.
and I'm speaking of the murders of Mike Brown, Jimmy Rice, oh. Eric Garner, Sonia Bland. I, I could go on and on and on. And there are photographs and video <coughs> and what there is not in justice. And what my concern is is for justice, not for documentation. I'm really happy to see what's been happening in our town with the, all the development around the southern gateway and the bicycle paths, and the bicycle program, and the new housing. And all of this is about welcoming a growing, progressive, diverse, and beautiful community. What we're talking about here tonight, as so many of my fellow citizens have said, works against our community and our feeling of welcome and beauty of community. <coughs> talked a little bit before about how you're not sure whether it was possible to maybe like subpoena the video information that you've gathered. And the thing about video and facial recognition and things like that are that those, you can apply those technologies after from the like oh. third party. It doesn't have to be baked into the software. So, um, that's just and my question was more about, it was related to continued operating costs. I'd like to know um, whether you manage storage of that data internally or whether you outsource it to a third party. And I would like to know about how much it costs you currently and how much do you expect that cost to increase. Okay, so the question is about storage of data mm -hmm. and Kind of longer costs. Okay. So we're talking about having a, a server that would be held in-house. So we would have, we wouldn't be using the cloud or, or anything like that. Um, so we would have a server in our IT room and in the station, um, and that cost. I don't. I, I only know the cost of the entire project that I gave you before. I don't know the cost of the individual server. I want to say between ten and fifteen thousand, maybe right around there. Just kind of my guess on the server. Um, and what's that? Annual. Uh, no, no, just no. Um, so if you use the cloud, you pay an annual cost to store lots of memory. And actually, when we're looking body cameras, as we're considering them, um, that was one of the things that you know we're looking at is using the cloud, and you do pay uh, annual storage to store information there. Uh, but that's expensive. That that we have a shorter retention cycle for what we're proposing here with just three weeks, and that's why it's a small server, a little less. But uh, so, and then that's the cost of that. Uh, the cameras have a lifespan here in England of somewhere between five years, six years, somewhere around there, and there are replacement. You know, the cameras themselves are say it depends on the camera four ish, five ish, somewhere around that. The infrastructure that we have in the city is already excellent, and that there's not a lot of other things. We Need to do other than you know put a camera up. The underground infrastructure is, is already there, so that's kind of the anticipated long-term cost uh, of the program. You can kind of figure out what that might look like. Yes. So, hearing what we have to say, what's your takeaway on what North Hampton thinks about these cameras? <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I have to say, like, I, I, I mean, this has been a great, a great week. This is actually a great discussion, and I, I mean that so sincerely. This is a difficult topic. It's a tricky time. Like, I wanted to have this discussion so that I could hear you. I'm sitting here so listening to you. So what's your sense? Do you want them or not? <laughs> <laughs> this is a group, uh, you know, it doesn't seem like a lot of people talking want them. Um, and, and I totally hear that. But more than whether the group wants them or doesn't want them, it's about all the things you're sharing, about some of the challenges that we, that would come up if we had cameras. You know, and the ones that are standing up to me listening to you all are about um, immigration and ICE, you know, and that's a, that's something that our department and our city, our city leaders hold very near and dear. 
So that's, you know, as this comes up in this conversation, it's really, and violating your Fourth Amendment rights. Yes. So, yes. Well, you're already on camera so many places downtown. That doesn't mean we have to increase We don't. That doesn't mean we have to increase more people. I get it. I get it. So I'm hearing a lot about concerns. And, and the other concern that, that people are voicing, and I've heard kind of a couple people say, is really this money could be better spent somewhere else. That's what I'm hearing. A lot of people talk about services for some of our populations that are less fortunate. So those are kind of my two ones that are standing out to me, but it's not to say that I'm not hearing all your other thoughts. Yes? I Focus is on uh, Main Street North Hampton. So there are two things that should really be done you know, like a lot of things are said, like the businesses and the pets and the progress, right? So I spent a lot of my years in a city which has, you know, perhaps what one of the cities with the largest number of urban scanner in the world, which is central London, and has a lot of projects. And we've all seen the news that we have heard the great pictures of terrorist attack after terrorist attack all over central London. And what has come out is that they have not been able to stop it. They know these people because their community policing is garbage. They have brought in more and more and more technology. And every time they brought in technology, the conditions of work for police officers has suffered. So their attention has suffered. So it's like, you know, so it's a situation where even if I agree that, you know, even if I agree to the need for safety, the need for policing, there is no evidence anywhere in the world that bringing in cameras and technology has helped either the people or the service. So, you know,
they're calling these cameras truth cameras because images themselves <laughs> always need to be interpreted like the truth is never an image itself. And I often share a story with my students to uphold the Northern Police Department and talk about the Northern Police Department's values is that one morning uh, I was on my way to get coffee and there were two people that looked like they were having a big dispute, a man and a woman. Um, and to me it just looked like uh, this man was about to attack this woman and that was just, you know, like I really wanted a big police response from my point of view across the street. Uh, and so I called the police, uh, you know, and from my vantage it looked one way, but actually um, when the police came, they had contact with both people already. Uh, and the, the truth was that both people had a history of mental illness and uh, had a history with cooperating with the police, and the police were able to de-escalate that situation really quickly because of Northampton's um, values as, as somebody who's not just going to rely on a camera in the sky, but who's going to have this context. Um, on the ground. Uh, but the fact that you're calling these truth cameras already signals a shift in your values, right? That the truth can somehow be found in an image rather than, you know, that the truth being produced, you know, with your context and many people on the ground. So um, I'm really worried about the way that this shifts, uh, what community basically means, um, and what the values are.
money with Marjorie Hess. I live on the Sonic Street. Um, thank you, Chief Cancer, for holding this meeting. I'm against the installation of surveillance cameras downtown because I think it will change the tenor of the downtown. I've lived in Northampton for 35 years, the last 20 on the Sonic Street. I love living in Northampton, especially downtown. I love that I can walk around town saying hello to so many people. Uh, many, I don't know their names, but we all recognize each other as long-time Northampton downtown residents. I love seeing the crowds on weekend evenings, especially in the summer, um, both people, residents of Northampton and people from the town. There are always groups waiting to cross at the four corners of Main and Pleasant and King Street. And when the walk light comes on, there's this wonderful dance as people cross <laughs> diagonally and interweave with each other. Most of all, I love the sounds around town saying, wherever you are from, you are welcome here. The downtown is open, friendly, and welcoming. Mm -hmm. I fear all of that would change with surveillance cameras. Surveillance cameras do not say, you are welcome here. They say, we don't trust you, we are watching you, and that's not the community I wish to live in. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Two general questions. One, you mentioned several towns like Amherst and East Hampton that have these cameras. Do you have any statistics from them as to how it's affected crime rates or reduced it or, or changed that? So, so is there any any data there that is useful? And secondly, um, you know, as I look at your <coughs> website with the statistics there, going back to 2003, the number, total number of your police calls have now, for the second time since 2003, been over 40,000. The highest number of arrests are in assaults and, and uh, larceny. And we're looking at a tripling of the number of heroin and narcon um, issues that this town has faced since in, in just the last three years. So um, I guess. Everybody, I bet most people in this room have cameras and have taken those in public. And you look at, in reference to London, I think New York now is one of the safest cities, but they also have one of the largest numbers of cameras, too. So I would tend to be for it with, with many of the reservations that people have about facial imaging and immigrants and so on and so forth. But I think there's some real issues there. But given what I see as a rise in crime, in this town since 2003 or more recently since 2006, um, do you really feel this will, will stop that escalation of crime in this, in this town? Mm -hmm. and, and then question. the other first part was other towns that have similar cameras. Right. So regarding the first part, uh, mm -hmm. as far as data from Amherst and East Hampton and Belcher Town, I don't have data from them. I mean, I've been working on putting this together. We just announced it last week. I'm busy, so I don't right. have that, and I don't, I don't know what it is. I've read a lot of research, and I'm sure many of you may have read different research articles, and I've read it both ways. You know, I've certainly read a lot of research that doesn't support closed-circuit television surveillance cameras in certain types of areas, and that it's, they're more effective in other types of areas, so certainly that's still kind of out there. Um, it is hard to find a... I mean, comparable communities that have what we have in this concentrated area. We're so unique. Um, in our community and how everything happens downtown. I mean, a lot of things happen downtown, right? So you saw our call data out of 40,000 calls, 25% is all in this very concentrated area. So that's kind of why we, you know, why we have this idea as a way to maybe be able to have a positive Im impact on that. So evidence from those communities, no, I don't have it. What was the second part of your question, Henry? Do, do you feel <laughs> as if the, the, um, the cameras would, in fact, sort of slow down this increase in crime that we've seen that in the last decade and a half? Well, I mean, as I, as I talked about, I certainly think that it would have an impact on some of the things that it sounds like from this room, people don't have as much of a value on. I think it would have a big impact on mm -hmm. theft and property crime. Mm -hmm. And the strong research out there that I've read about, that is an area, mostly like car breaks and parking lots, yeah. it seems to have a really positive impact on that and reduce that crime. Um, but, you know, this is different than that. It's such a unique community. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, so, and I do think that the deterrent effect, aside from that, 
is that some of the instances we're able to provide closure. I mean, that's what we're trying to do to people who come to us and need help, you know. And in those cases, it would be nice to be able to provide that closure and hopefully prevent some of those things from happening again. So the deterrent effect may be small unless you're the victim of that crime. It doesn't feel small if it's you that didn't have that happen to you, you know. So th those are my thoughts on that. Yeah. Okay, so a comment and then a question. Um, so addiction is a disease, and I know that you mentioned um, in your PowerPoint that it would be mostly targeting drug dealers. Um, with that being said, I have nothing against someone who is violent, someone who has weapons, um, but how the criminalization of addiction is such a thing, and that only leads to incarceration and recidivism and essentially more addiction. Um, how do you think that surveillance cameras um, would impact the criminalization of addicts? Uh, so we're a community that's pretty, uh, we, we made a lot of really great changes in that area where honestly when I came on years ago there was, the stigma around addiction was super different, right? Like we can all acknowledge that. The terms we use for people who were struggling with addiction, the fact that we were pretty quick to lock people up. Um, I'm not proud to say that, but like that's how it was then, and that's the, the, the you know agencies that many of us came into. But we've spent a lot of time learning about this addiction, and we were just talking beforehand about uh, Dr. Ruth uh, Cote. I always pronounce her name wrong. Yes. She's brilliant. I don't know if you ever heard her talk yeah. about addiction. It's absolutely incredible. And like Adam is as one of the gentlemen in the middle there is one of our dart officers. He goes out and he talks to people who've overdosed. He's driven people to the hospital to get them. You know. We're pretty focused on getting people help. That's what our goal has been. I, I don't. I mean, we carry an arc and we're, we're participating in a lot of incredible collaborative efforts with the DA's office, with Hampshire Hope. We do a lot in that area, and I feel pretty confident saying that we've changed the stigma quite a bit. You know, in the way that we talk about people who are dealing with addiction. Do we have room for growth? Absolutely. You know, absolutely. It's, it's hard to go from seeing someone and putting them in one box. And then being like, oh, wait a minute, you know, I misclassified that person. Like, it's it's different, you know. And it takes time to learn that. Certainly not anything you can just get in a in a class or you know just learn one day. It takes time to really talk to people who struggle with addiction and start to learn more about it. And honestly, all the work that we've done in destigmatizing, yeah, that's important. But also, I bet all these guys would agree. Just working with so many people who have addiction, it's you know nobody wants to go on these calls where you see someone who you know, has stolen a bunch of property and like they are doing it because they're dealing with their addiction. It's tough, you know, and that's how we, we learn about people who have addictive problems as well. So we've come a long way. I don't think that the camera program concept um, has too much to do with like people who are just struggling with addiction. Uh, I do think it but could drug use in particular. Would it be yeah. not because on the streets? I mean, I don't know how many people are actually doing drugs on Main Street. Right. But would it target people who are using drugs? Very rare to have anyone using drugs on Main Street, and I, I no. I mean, that's just not our intent. You know, and and we don't have the time or energy or anything to sit there and watch what everyone's doing on Main Street. But I understand that fear, and I've heard that voiced by a lot of people. I'm not dismissive of that. I'm just saying. The reality of what we all know in the station is like, it, you know, it'll be there and and we would look back on many things and use it for, for larger events. Uh, but no, I mean, people using on the street, you know, I'm sure we can all say, we've walked up and we've found people shooting up, you know, in somewhere, wherever it may be. Not often on Main Street, that's pretty rare that we would have that on Main Street, but you know, tucked off somewhere. And we're extremely compassionate. And in most cases, try to get people hooked up to services. I mean, that's the most, you know, one of the most likely outcomes that you would have if you would, if you came into the lobby with heroin. You're like, please help me. Adam would come in and, and talk with you, get you services, make phone calls. He spent hours with you. And it's one of the things that I didn't touch on before is that our jobs have changed a lot in a really great way. But the expectations on us and how we handle calls. Honestly, I mean, not that it was effective, but we used to just kind of arrest people. I mean, that was kind of the way the system worked. Extremely ineffective, extremely ineffective. That's what we did, because that's what we thought was right. Now, we spend a long time on calls. De-escalation, getting connected with resources, all those things. You know, we spend hours sometimes on a scene trying <coughs> to get people exactly what they need and provide them with the services that they need. So, to vary in a long way answer your question, <laughs> I don't think the cameras are going to have, you know, any impact on that or in any way negatively impact people who are struggling with addiction. That's a population that we work really closely with 
and we collaborate with many stakeholders in the communities with you know, Tapestry and, and Hampshire Hope and so many places to try to get people help. And I truly think we would all agree that we know people need help not going into jails. Yep. I would really echo so many things that have already been said contra this proposal, but just to build off of what you were just saying and answering her question, I mean, is this the future of policing? Like, in 10 years, would you look back on this and say, oh, that's when we started towards better policies of policing? Or would you say what you're saying now, which was, that's what, how we did it back in the bad old days. We wouldn't do that now. And I really, really seriously doubt that, and I mean, hearing what you say about the values of the department and the direction it wants to move in, I doubt you would be coming out of the next 10 years saying that was really where we started down the right path and that moved us into our future of the best possible policing practices we could have. And I hate to see us taking a step with little evidence, little direct evidence showing that it's going to you know, be helpful mm -hmm. for countering, for even for achieving the specific goals you have for it. We don't have the evidence saying it will work. And it's something that seems like it would be really hard to pull back out of. It would be a lot of work for whoever comes in next to this department, who you know is the person that's maybe 20 now who replaces you guys in 15 years. And for them, for them to, to go back on this would be really difficult. Unless, if you're really serious about basing it only on evidence, you made it so, OK, these cameras are dead in five years, according to what you're expecting due to weather and whatever, say, unless these metrics are met and this is a successful program, that's it. Throw the cameras away and that's it. We tried it. It didn't work. There has to be something built in to say this isn't forever. If, we're, if you are going to go forward with this, if there really are strong reasons. I don't think there's a strong reason to commit to it for the you know unforeseeable <laughs> future for, for whatever, with, especially with the concerns that have been mentioned about federal policy changes and who knows what and who knows who gets access to this information further down the line. I think you really need to be Thinking long term. Great. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so I'm a criminal defense attorney, and I just have to respond to the comments you just made about drug policies in this town. Um, if you can go and sit in in any of the courthouses in this county, and in Franklin County, and in Hampton County, people are routinely still being arrested for drug possession. People are still routinely being arrested for being addicts. People are still routinely being put in jail for violations of probation for a single relapse and so and, and the, there's a diversion program in the Northampton District Court. I have yet to get a client in because they don't qualify because that program still divides people into the good users versus the bad users. Yep. And almost everyone mm -hmm. qualifies as a bad user. It's, it's, I mean I, I just I, I there's so much public discourse about this changing narrative. It has not made its way into the court system in these towns. The district attorney's office is still indicting people with mandatory minimum sentences, but they go to prison for years and years and years for being addicts. That is still happening in this town and the towns around us. So I just I couldn't let that sit. shops and who can afford to shop at the shops. The public spaces are for everybody. And, you know, this particularly, you know, we, this time right now, um, as was said before, in terms of what's happening with the federal government and what's happening right here in Massachusetts, there have been multiple scandals um, among law enforcement, among government agencies. There's been scandals in the drug labs. There's been uh, scandals with the Office of Alcohol Testing where it turns out that the evidence that was supposedly gathered in an objective, fair way, and supposedly tested in an objective, fair way, it turns out wasn't objective, wasn't fair, was being tampered with in a way to punish poor people, punish people of color. I mean, and so it's, you know, I, you can't, you, you can't, uh, expect people to just trust that A, will uh, agree with the policies that you implement to, you know, move forward with these programs, and B, that everyone's going to follow the policies. You know, racial profiling is just a matter of fact, and uh, the same thing with the classism that is just a part of the policing system, and, and it, which is, you know, there's simply no way to tease that out, and so I think that what you're hearing from the community is don't separate us into good and bad. It's all of us or none of us. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I, I did. I, I wanted to talk about the drug lab scandal. Yep. Um, because I think it ties 
into something that you've said a couple times throughout the night, which is we're not going to do facial recognition technology. No, we're not going to do this. And the problem is Massachusetts is home to two very large drug scandals where we had Annie Dukin working with prosecutors, knowingly lying about testing drugs, knowing it wasn't drugs, and saying it was. And hundreds and thousands of people went to jail and served jail time. And this was a gross abuse of power. And this was one scandal that happened. And this is what happens when power goes unchecked. And to me, this is a perfect example of increasing power, increasing police power, and I have very big concerns about what happens when power goes unchecked. It's great that you tell us we're not going to be using facial recognition, um, but, but how do we know? And, 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 and even more locally, and, and Annie Duke is, is local, but even more locally and more recently, we have Sonia Farrakh, um, who was, uh, who after evidence was coming out that she was using drugs while testing drugs for the police, uh, an arm of the police, an arm of the prosecution, then we find out they were hiding evidence um, from the courts, from the defense attorneys, that actually demonstrated that she was doing this. And, and yet again, more people, more innocent people were put in harm's way. And, and this is what happens when power goes unchecked. And uh, these are real concerns. Thank you. Did you reach out to the prosecuting attorney's office to come to this meeting tonight? Because this, these issues, the prosecuting attorney should have a chance to speak about it. But I also feel that often the police do their job, but the difficulties arise out of the prosecutor's office, which may have detailed some of that. And uh, the police are not the separation of police function from prosecutors good thing, but if the prosecuting attorney's office is not doing the right things in terms of uh, the evidence and, and uh, courtroom procedures, the police, what the police do is a little... Okay, so, so just about the district attorney's office, I didn't invite them particularly to be here tonight, I mean it was an open invitation certainly, but I didn't make any direct <coughs> calls them and say, hey, come to this. So that's just what that question and, or statement was about. Yep. Chief, I'll just stand up so I can be heard. Um, I think that what you're asking for here, or what is proposed, is an extraordinary government action to turn Northampton and its main street into a surveillance state. Because you're saying we're going to wire main street up and down. You have examples from uh, computer stores on Pleasant Street to make the statistics, but you're going to wire Main Street. It's a surveillance state on Main Street. And I think, as a lot of people have expressed, that makes a lot of us really uncomfortable. And I think that that kind of extraordinary government action requires extraordinary proof that it's really going to make us safer, by and large, everybody safer. And in the absence of that kind of proof, you should, you should not, the city shouldn't be doing this. Yes. And I, I'd like to, and I know you've pointed out, and I appreciate you sending me, mm -hmm. the uh, model policy. So here's what it says, because a lot of people have talked about facial recognition technology, and I think this policy actually permits it. Here's what it says. Video images captured by the surveillance system will be automatically recorded over after 21 days. So far, so good. Unless the department, the police department, or another law enforcement agency submits a request to review the captured in images for a legitimate criminal investigation. The FBI, ICE, Immigration Contro Control and Enforcement, does not call up and say, hi, we have an illegitimate investigation. We're just snooping around for no reason whatsoever, but give us your images. They call up and they say, hi, we're investigating. We want to see the pride parade. We want to see this demonstration in support of, of immigrants. We want to see the people who came here in support of Black Lives Matter. We want those images. And then they go to the FBI because they have 21 days to ask and you'll give it to them. 
and they'll go to Homeland Security, and they'll go to ICE, and then they can take that technology, and they can use all of their face recognition technology and all the other technology they can. And so to say that there's some sort of safety here, I think, Chief, I think you're really good. I think it's the worst idea you've had in your, in your I've tenure. Had worse. I've had worse. <laughs> yeah, but you didn't tell me. Yeah, that's true. That's true. Um, and you cannot guarantee the privacy of the people of Northampton because the other police departments and law enforcement agencies across the state, including the Fusion Center and the federal government, and all of those law enforcement agencies will have absolute access to what happens on the streets of Northampton. And what happens on the streets of Northampton makes us a vital, a vital community is the ability to protest, the ability to feel free to protest, and not to feel that the federal government is now what are we going to put up a big sign? Welcome to Northampton. You can have an FBI file just for being here. I mean, that's ridiculous. <laughs> but it's what it does. It's what it does. Because they'll use the technology even if you won't. So the, the one thing I would just caution is that, so I forwarded to Bill a, a draft policy, as I said. It's a model policy from Kalia that is, you know, has some small modifications, but it's certainly not in any way any final product. I mean, if this is something that was written, and like we would, if we were ever to pursue this, have a conversation about components of it that weren't good or, you know, whatever needed to be changed. So it's a draft policy uh, from other agencies that have used it. Uh, but I, I certainly hear what you said uh, strongly, uh, and I know we had some other questions over here. Go ahead. Well, I have a question about privacy in public spaces. Like you keep saying this is public space you're surveilling, mm -hmm. but I'm a private person. It seems I have a right to be, do whatever I'm going to do privately, mm -hmm. even without anyone knowing, even I'm in a public space. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't really make sense to me. Like, um, I'm not a lawyer. Bill, advise me on this. I mean, I don't want people to know what I'm doing in a public space. Unless I'm doing something wrong, then someone could arrest me. But if I'm just going about my business, mm -hmm. I have my own private space, and that's mine. And I don't feel right. like I should be. That's called the right. Mm -hmm. liberty. Right, right. So I, I do. Back, go back. ahead, Bill, if you want to. Well, I, I, a couple of points. First of all, I think that what we need to keep in mind is the chilling effect that all of this is going to have on First Amendment rights, which is if you think that you go out and protest and the FBI and Homeland Security and ICE are going to have your images and all the people you're talking to and your friends and colleagues and you're all going to be in a database of the FBI and Homeland Security and ICE, you may not do it. So what happens on the streets matters, and this has an enormous chilling effect on our First Amendment rights to freedom of speech and, and, and to protest and to assemble and to say, oh, well, the police are just monitoring the crowds. Great. Well, not so great, but, <laughs> but, it's, certainly, but it's certainly, it's certainly, not, it's, certainly not, it's certainly not something that we want from ICE or the FBI. And you can say it's just, it's just the model policy and we've just tweaked it a little. Fine, but once you have the images and you're a law enforcement, you'll never keep them from other law enforcement who wants it. And can you tell us that you could? No, no, no I can't. But what about privacy in a public space? Okay, so you have a sense of in a public space, what a person has as their privacy rights is very personal. You can't say there's a generic privacy right if you're out in public. But I think we can say as citizens, we have a privacy right to believe we're not being surveilled every time we go to the main street of our town and that the police department is going to have that image and will be able to retain that image and law enforcement across the country will have it as well. I think we have that privacy right and we right have that as citizens and because it's a moral and ethical and political right that we as residents of the city of Northampton and as visitors to the city should have and should maintain. And the person who made this comment about what will happen in five years, if this kind of technology is implemented here now, what will be here in five years will make this look like kid stuff. Because it's not going to be rescinded. It's going to get worse. It's going to get bigger. It's going to be more of an intrusion. And the day that we said, well, there was this nice meeting, but no one paid any attention to what the people of the city really thought, we'll rue that day. <laughs> Yes? Okay. Yes? Um, hi, I know I already spoke, um, but this is more of a um, uh, <laughs> different kind of question. Um, I would like everyone in this room to keep telling you what a terrible idea this is, but um, I know that some people have already left. 
um, while we still have a good number of people, I would like to know um, how long you will be considering this decision um, and how you will communicate to us what decision um, you have made and how many other opportunities there are for us to tell you how wrong this is. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I'm, I'm not going to stand here and lock myself into a timeline. You know, it's, I'm, I'm a pretty thoughtful person and I think you have thoughtful community leaders. So this is a discussion that, you know, here I, I, we have a lot of, of interesting takeaway points that everyone's voiced. Um, and I'll think about those. As I, I mean, as I do, I think our department has a history of that. You know, we do listen to our community and we respond when things are brought up. Um, and I think we, we do a pretty good job at that. And like, so this is something that uh, people have been fantastic here voicing their opinions. And I, I, you know, I actually had someone that I know walk up to me at the beginning and say, but just so you know, like, I, I really like you. I know we're kind of friends, but I disagree. <laughs> you know, I, I, disagreement is like the, the heartbeat of our community. You know, and it's no problem. Like I, but I, I value both opinions, everyone's opinions, because they're important. This is our community. I'm part of the community too, you know, and uh, we all are. Our children are in the schools. We're walking down the streets. Our families are at these protests. So we understand this, and I'm listening to you. And I'm not going to lock into a time, um, but I'm going to think about it, and I'm sure that we'll, in some way, uh, you know, let our community know what that feedback is. And if we feel like we need to have further discussion on it, we would certainly let you know that too. It uh, won't be any secret if you watch us on Facebook. I'm sure anything would be on there. Okay? Yep. I, I'm sure. I'm sure the Gazette may pick it up. If. I echo what you said about believing in your good faith. I'm a criminal defense attorney. The people that that some of this will be used against are going to be my clients and other people's clients, some of the other attorneys as well. I understand being able to have an image. But I want, to, I want you to remember that one of the things you said about the woman who had served on the grand jury is that the image, you know, it says something, but that you can make your own decision about it. Mm -hmm. That's one thing. Mm -hmm. I mean, I understand what you're saying. You showed us pictures and said, that's an armed robbery. It could have been something else. Mm -hmm. We have to trust you as our police chief that that right. wasn't right. that an armed robbery. Mm -hmm. um, when I get a discovery and it's my client, no, it's a problem. Right, right. <laughs> That's your evidence. It stands with other evidence. I mean, like I said, we never stand alone on it, but yes. But, but there's other things. Yep. It, you know, I understand what people are saying about uh, some of this is, I mean, I don't care about property rights. Uh, I'm an old person, and I've lived in this community for 38 years. Uh, I, I just say that I'm never given a name. I know that. But um, uh, I, I've seen downtown change a lot, a lot. And there are some businesses that I care about less than others. <laughs> I would say that. Um, but I also think that it's their responsibility to protect their property. Uh, it's, uh, I don't think that it's... I mean, we pay for that by paying the prices that they charge us. I mean, it's almost impossible to shop downtown. Um, so I think it's the store's responsibility to have better cameras inside. And you can't manage that. But it's, that's also their problem. Um, and the businesses that have the good ones have the good ones, and they're willing to pay for it. And those who don't are going to have to deal with burdening you by having to look at their garbage. Um, and you, you know, you can't make them change that. But I don't think that the solution is putting cameras on Main Street to stop the shopping. And it's interesting to know, and I should probably know this based on advocacy of my own clients that people come into town to shop with. In the same way that people come into town to be busters or uh, panhandlers, because we have a reputation of being a giving community, we don't want it to be giving by stealing, but we have that reputation. I think things like um, breaking into cars, if people would just lock their cars for God's sake, it's not a hard thing to do. Tell them to do that. But I don't think that necessarily, I mean, I don't know, because I don't know everything that you know, that you have to deal with. But I don't think it happens on Main Street. I hear a lot about it in the parking lot, like by my office, um, uh, wood shops, mm -hmm. and places like that, the parking lots. Mm -hmm. And I think, really, you go down Main Street to have fun in a restaurant or a bar, and you leave your car open, and you leave your wallet in your car, you are nice. And I can't have to fix that. Um, and I think the other concerns about the chilling effect on the rest of them, and you know what you've been at the demonstrations, you know what that is. You understand that. You're a part of this community. I think that has to take precedence. Mm -hmm. It's part of the values. You said it. That's why we trust you. 
Mm -hmm. You understand it. That's the values of this community, to support those kinds of things, mm -hmm. not to make us feel like we're living in 1984. Mm -hmm. That Big Brother is a wanting. And I, and I don't have, even though you make my job hard when your evidence is really good, <laughs> I don't um, resent that. Uh, because we understand in a different way mm -hmm. about, about within the court system, I don't necessarily like to use the word truth anymore because it's been battered so badly. <laughs> but you and I understand that when you have good evidence, you make my job hard, but that's, that's what it is. Mm -hmm. um, and, and you're not using garbage evidence to put some of the way, you know, and I'm going to fight you. Right? Mm -hmm. uh, the drug thing is a very good point. You have to admit that. You're not going to stop addiction. Mm -hmm. And I know that there are still things going on. You don't have complete control over this about prosecution and jailing of people when it should be treatment, and you're doing what you can do. I understand that. There's still arrests are happening. That's it happens. They, and it's often connected to something else, right, right. like a larceny. Yep. Um, uh, and the DA's office, don't even get <laughs> I would, uh, you know, the DA's office supports the police department, so they may have, I don't think the DA's office, I'll read that to what cameras would be, but, you know, it, it's not going to solve, it, I, don't think, I don't believe it's going to be children. There may be some things that people may know, oh, there's a camera here, I'm not going to steal that bike. Maybe. But you also know that the people who commit crimes are the last thing they do is think. Mm -hmm. I'm telling you, I love these people. <laughs> I mean, last night I came home from work and I thought, you know what, I am sick to death of my job because I'm trying to fix problems for people who don't think before they act. Mm. Sometimes it's youth, sometimes it's gender, excuse me being sexist, males under 25, we all know, la la la. Sometimes the ladies under 25 too. I think all the female brain, I deal with it all the time. Drug addiction, mental illness, the, you know, Talk about the policies and how this is changing this community. <coughs> Understand people know people in the community we're talking about. The press covered, and I'm sure that it was with some encouragement, the community places that goes on. Bicycle pro patrols came <coughs> during your tenure, not necessarily chief, but during your time on the force. A little before. A little before. before. Yep. The community policing, what I saw, unfortunately, was officers in the stores. I thought, wait a minute, wait a minute. What about, I mean, also talking to people on the street, but then I've seen it. Mm -hmm. I walk downtown, I work downtown. Adam talks to everybody, and so does everybody. Ryan. You can't get away from Adam, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Adam and Ryan are chat. Right. Um, <laughs> you know, and, and the attitude about police is going to vary by people. Do we want more police on the streets? No. 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 So that's Sometimes the answer is yes. In terms of big demonstrations, I understand what you're saying, but if someone is going to walk in with a, a vest loaded with ammunition, a backpack loaded with a pressure cooker, you may be able to, able to identify the person after it happens, but it's not going to be deterrence. It hasn't happened. One of the cameras hasn't stopped it. I didn't even know, and I've been, I think I've been countless my life. I think I've seen sometimes the fire trucks at the ends of streets. Mm -hmm. that's, that's what stops people from running down in the middle and killing people. That's bad. <coughs> the cameras aren't going to do that. Mm -hmm. The fire trucks do that. So it, a lot of this is just echoing, but it's believing in good faith. <clears throat> but it, it has more to do with being able to solve some things, but it's not going to stop it, and it, and it has too much of a chilling effect on the things that they hold here in this community. Okay, thank you. It's about 12 of 9, so I'll take a few more questions, and I want to be mindful of time, and we'll wrap up at 9. Uh, there was someone who just said there. Yep. Hi, I'm a professor of sociology at UMass Amherst, and I'm uh, an urban sociologist, and everyone has their guiding light, and for me, it's a 1961 book called The Death and Life of Great American Cities by Jane Jacobs, and in there she has this fantastic chapter about eyes on the street, and she says that you have to have eyes on the street to have a lovely, lovely place. 
You have culture, you have community, you have people meeting and talking. I love these posters where we see that we, 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 I see my neighbors and I watch them. These are the kinds of eyes that she talks about in that book. These are not the eyes that she talks about in this book. The uh, evocation of the, the panopticon is a very important one. Uh, the belief was is that it is a, is a gentle way of treating people to, give, to make them appear like everyone's, someone is watching. But it's an insidious form of authority that embeds itself into our, into our lives, our minds. And in particular, not just the ones, I don't like the idea of the good and the bad. I think we all do something wrong. We've all, we've all you know, run a traffic light. Uh, there's, but there, in particular, the, the communities of color, uh, the homeless, our, our most vulnerable populations, our new uh, 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 refugees here, these are the ones that I do not want to have that panoptic gaze embedded into their head. I want them to feel free, I want them to feel loved, and I want the public to be embracing of them and not be terrified of them. And for me, that's, that's how I feel. I respect you. I respect, I respect you, you a lot, and that you know. And I think that this is. I, I echo the point. Um, it's it, it's the worst safety I've heard. Thank you. Thank you. There was. Uh, I think. Uh, okay. You go ahead. First, I want to thank you and your offices for being here and for making this the whole thing. I agree. Anybody can come. I I think it is fantastic. Um, I haven't been here a whole long time, but I've been here as long as I have kids in school, and your facing program, getting into the community. I think it's a wonderful idea, your cards. I, this is a little bit off topic, but it's what you do and what your officers do with enthusiasm. With our but I want to know about this Kalia model. Mm -hmm. um, do you have evidence-based studies that will tell us what would happen? I, I, I really am very much against it, but mm -hmm. I would like to know to help me. Yeah, if yeah. you have evidence-based studies that if you go into this program, if these are going to be available to all of us so that we can read what the evidence-based study said and where it happened and how it happened and what it did to the sheer crime and... Right. So that's a great question. And I like to do everything on evidence. I mean, that's how we like to do things that we know are successful if we can prove that they are in other places. So, and you know, I reviewed a lot of evidence before coming here tonight. And I could have thrown up slides that had a ton of support, right? <coughs> but then I could have also, there's a lot of other studies that don't support them, right? So how do I sift through that and pick out what's right? I'm not. I'm not, I'm not going to sift through and hand pick what's, what's right and what's not. I read things that they're good in some areas. It depends, you know, how they're placed. It depends what you're trying to target. How do you measure success? You know, what, what is your standard for success? What are you trying to do? So some communities have had a lot of success in, as I said, parking lots would like car brakes. So we're not targeting car brakes. We don't have car brakes on Main Street. That's not something we're particularly trying to, to target. So for us, like, that's less relevant information. Others, you know, do they have impact on behavior? Yes, some have said yes. Many have said no, right? So what do I bring you? I, I, I can't, in any fairness, put anything up here. A sociologist would probably be the best one to study and really find, uh, just much like you, I'm extremely, you know, uh, I guess suspicious of any study. Who did it and like wh what was their, how did they choose what they did and what were the time frames? I, research is, I'm very sus <laughs> suspicious of research that I read. Because you all know, you can take research and make it an answer any way you want. Um, and so I don't want to present you with that. What I'm telling you is we have a community for 20 years, you know, we've had cases where we're like, ah, oh, if only there were a camera there, right? So like that's, that's real, not to say that <laughs> Who knows? But like we've had many of those cases. So would we have success with some of those cases in the future? Probably. But we all know also this is an issue of privacy and safety and how much do we value Northampton Police Department's ability to solve those crimes that we think we'd be able to solve, you know, versus privacy. This group seemingly privacy is weighed very heavily <laughs> over the safety factor and, and that's what I'm hearing. So I, I definitely hear that. Did I answer that question? Yes. Yes. Thank you. Yeah, and we have just about seven more minutes. I just want to distinguish in the rest of the conversation, even though it's short, because I think it's such an important distinction to make between uh, property recovery and safety. Yep. Because there has to be yeah. so if we're talking about safety, let's talk about safety mm -hmm. and how this will keep people, make people more safe. Mm -hmm. uh, and if we're talking about property recovery or reducing mm -hmm. shoplifting, that's not a safety issue. Mm -hmm. It's a different issue. I'm yep. not saying that shoplifting is great or that we should all run around taking things that don't belong to us, mm -hmm. but that's not a safety issue. Mm -hmm. So I just want to make that distinction and, and just 
that, so that we use our terms. Right, and, and so to be clear, like there's a number of potential, you know, goals that we would have, and those are two separate ones, right? Addressing shoplifting and larcenies downtown is one, but certainly other safety issues that we've talked about, the, the larger crowds and also um, some of the particular crimes that we've talked about that we'd like to prevent from happening again uh, also would fall under the safety. But the, the, much like traffic accidents, I mean, we'd, th that's different as well. So there's different areas that we're looking at that have proven in some areas to be successful. So that's... It, they're different. They're different goals. I just, yep. Uh, first, I would like to say thank you for having this open discussion and, and listening to the community. Um, thank you very much. Thank and you. And I am all for helping the police um, solve crimes. Um, but I'm just very curious what, as a community, we can do to convince you to decide no. <laughs> um, I mean, what will you need, really, in reality, like for you to be able to say, okay, you know what, this community really doesn't need this. Um, and what maybe the community can do other than having surveillance technology to um, help with the crimes, like maybe better store cameras, maybe. Um, you know, those, those kind of things. But first and foremost, thank you. And what can we do as a community to really, truly, officially make it clear mm -hmm. and then have you recognize that we don't want it? Like, what would you need? Like, how much of the population? Right, I, I appreciate that question. Um, so I. You know, I'm hearing everything that you're saying. This is how we make decisions. I'm a firm believer in collective intelligence. I can't stand in my position as your police chief and say, this is good for our community, you know? And actually, it's not how I, I lead within my agency either. I'm constantly asking my captains and my supervisors, like, what do you guys think? Is this a good idea? Like, and, and I truly believe in that, and that's why we're here. So what you need to do to convince me, either way, however you feel, is to be present and to be here and engage with your community leaders, and that's what you're doing. So you're here, uh, you know. I'm not going to sit here and tell you, like, tomorrow at noon I will decide and it's going to take a lot of postcards, which I'm sure now I'm going to get. But um, <laughs> I've already got a few, but feel free. They're, they're good. Um, but, you know, there's not a particular tipping point that I can give you. All I can tell you is that we're, we're thoughtful community leaders, everyone here. Your, your city councilors, your, your bill, you know, who <laughs> is a, a vocalist about so many things. Right? As we kind of wrap up, it's almost time, is that I'm... I'm thankful for everyone that came here and shared their thoughts and ideas. And I, I know there's, you know, a lot of strong feelings. I hear that. I'm a good listener. <laughs> I, I, I got what I got tonight from everyone. Um, and if we need more feedback to make a decision, I'll ask for it. And I'll, you know, um, certainly I, I'm not alone in any way. You know, we, the mayor is here. Many of your city councilors are here. And it's a, it's a conversation to, to um, further have. But I think tonight as I lull myself off to sleep. I'll be thinking about many of your many of your thoughts, you know, because they're they're really relevant, important thoughts to consider. Um, I'm just <laughs> I'm just as protective of all of our community members as many of you are. You know, I don't want to open up any members of our community to um, anything that puts anyone in, you know, risk or threat or